timing and triggering of the intraaortic balloon pump. Once the intraaortic balloon pump catheter is inserted, the console must be programmed to deliver therapy appropriate to each patient. To do this most effectively, the patient must be connected to the pump console via both the ECG and arterial pressure, enabling continuous monitoring of both waveforms to optimize recognition of the phases of the patient's cardiac cycle. The clinician can also use these waveforms as a measure of the efficacy of therapy. Modern intraaortic balloon pump technology has improved to such an extent that timing and triggering are automatically adjusted in response to changes in patient heart rate and rhythm. However, an understanding of these concepts remains important. Timing refers to the inflation and deflation of the balloon in relation to the patient's cardiac cycle. Trigger is the physiological signal from the patient that identifies the beginning of a new cardiac cycle. This triggering event is best sourced from the ECG, the R wave representing the onset of a new cardiac cycle. Timing. The objective of the intraaortic balloon pump is to inflate the balloon during diastole, improving diastolic flow of blood in the coronary and cerebral arteries, and to deflate immediately before systole, reducing the afterload against which the weakened heart is contracting. The waveforms taken from the aortic root arterial pressure can be used to determine the appropriateness of the timing of inflation and deflation. These diagrams depict a normal arterial pressure waveform and an augmented waveform produced by the intraaortic balloon pump. The first peak in this diagram corresponds to the patient's peak systolic blood pressure. This is the unassisted systole. The second higher peak is generated by the inflation of the balloon at the beginning of diastole, once the aortic valve has closed, an event identified by the dichrotic notch on the unassisted trace. The pressure in the proximal aorta rises, known as diastolic augmentation, supporting coronary and cerebral blood flow. As you can see, the value is suprasystolic, that is, higher than the patient's native systolic pressure. The third and final peak represents the patient's assisted systolic pressure and occurs after the support of the diastolic inflation and deflation of the balloon. Balloon deflation occurs during isovolumetric contraction immediately before the assisted systole and causes the assisted end diastolic pressure to be lower than the unassisted end diastolic pressure. This represents a reduction in afterload and cardiac work. The adequacy of augmentation can be measured by a number of factors, including the degree of increase in the diastolic augmented pressure from the assisted systolic pressure, as shown here. In general, there should be a 30 to 70% increase in the augmented diastolic pressure as compared to the assisted systolic pressure. However, it is important to understand that diastolic augmentation must not be assessed in isolation as it is influenced by many factors, including the position, size, and volume of the balloon, the circulating blood volume, left ventricular dysfunction, medications, and also improvement in hemodynamics and left ventricular function. These factors all reduce the diastolic augmentation in relation to the systolic pressure. The earlier examples may require intervention, while the latter example is evidence that the patient is improving. The balloon may be set to inflate at different ratios or frequencies, 1 to 1, 1 to 2, 1 to 4, and so on. 1 to 1 means the balloon inflates and deflates with every cardiac cycle, thus providing maximal support to the patient, i.e. each systole and each diastole is assisted. At the 1 to 2 frequency, the balloon inflates and deflates every alternate cardiac cycle, and so on. The 1 to 2 frequency is often used to wean the patient from the intraaortic balloon pump. A change in ratio from 1 to 1 to 1 to 2 halves the pressure in the great cardiac vein and is often the point of failure in the weaning process. The correct timing for inflation and deflation of the balloon is imperative to the functioning of the balloon pump. Inflation should be on closure of the aortic valve, 
marked by the dichrotic notch on the waveform. When the balloon inflates with the onset of diastole, blood is propelled under pressure through the coronary ostia above the aortic valve and into the coronary arteries, thus providing better perfusion pressures compared with the passive filling that occurs during diastole in the unassisted heart. With correct timing, the dichrotic notch should have a sharp V-shape. If the balloon is inflated early, before the aortic valve has closed, i.e. before rather than at the dichrotic notch on the arterial pressure waveform, the aortic valve is forced closed prematurely and there is an increase in afterload as the left ventricle contracts against the closed aortic valve. Stroke volume can be decreased by as much as 22%. Aortic regurgitation may also occur. Late inflation of the balloon reduces diastolic augmentation and its benefits. This is displayed on the pressure waveform as the loss of the sharp V at the dichrotic notch with a space between the notch and the diastolic augmentation peak. Deflation of the balloon should occur at the onset of systole during the pre-ejection phase of isovolumetric contraction when the left ventricle is building enough pressure to overcome the pressure in the aorta. Rapid deflation of the balloon creates an area of lowered pressure in the aorta just ahead of left ventricular ejection. This augments left ventricular emptying, reducing the left ventricular stroke work. With correct timing, the assisted end diastolic pressure should be a sharp V and lower than the patient's own end diastolic pressure. Late deflation of the balloon means the balloon remains inflated after systole has begun. The pressure waveform will now display an assisted aortic end diastolic pressure that is higher than the unassisted end diastolic pressure. The rate of rise of the assisted systole will be prolonged with a gentler upsloping gradient than usual and depending on the heart rate, diastolic augmentation may appear widened as it lasts for a longer period of time due to the balloon remaining inflated for longer. Physiologically, the afterload is increased as the left ventricle will be contracting against a greater resistance and so myocardial oxygen demand and consumption rise. Early deflation is when the balloon is incorrectly deflated during diastole. In this case, the waveform will display a sharp drop following diastolic augmentation rather than the usual gentle diastolic decay curve. This results in a loss of the beneficial reduction in afterload and left ventricular workload and can be visualized as an assisted end diastolic pressure and an assisted systole that is not lower than the unassisted end diastolic pressure or the unassisted systole. The loss of afterload reduction increases left ventricular work and myocardial oxygen demand, and the assisted systolic pressure may rise. A reduced efficiency of therapy results, and the negative pressure created by deflation of the balloon may cause coronary steel, where the blood is effectively sucked back out of the vessels. Clinically, the patient may experience angina or neurological change. Trigger. The console needs to be able to recognize the different phases of the cardiac cycle in order to begin therapy and to respond to changes in the patient's rate and rhythm. The most commonly used trigger signal is the R wave on the ECG, which denotes ventricular systole and the onset of a new cardiac cycle. An alternative but less reliable trigger is the aortic pressure waveform. An ECG is an effective mechanism to trigger inflation and deflation because the electrical events occur slightly before the corresponding mechanical events. Using the aortic pressure trigger can only detect systole and diastole as they occur, reducing the efficiency of the response. Errors in triggering may occur with pacing or arrhythmias. In practice, it is possible to support a paced patient with counterpulsation, but the trigger may need to change depending on the rhythm, the type of pacemaker, atrial or ventricular, and the patient's response to both therapies. These concepts are beyond the scope of this tutorial. Intraaortic balloon pumps may find it more difficult to cope with irregular rhythms, for example ectopics or atrial fibrillation, and the best way to overcome this problem 
is to attempt to restore a regular rhythm, be it with electrolyte correction, cardioversion, or antiarrhythmic medication. If the irregular rhythm persists, a trigger known as AFib can be utilized to deflate the balloon to match each R wave as it occurs in real time. This is known as R wave or real time deflation. Troubleshooting. If diastolic augmentation is inadequate, it is important to determine why. Three factors may affect diastolic augmentation. The patient, the catheter, or the pump. Factors affecting the pump have been considered above. Whenever there is a problem, it is important to assess the patient first. Many physiological parameters can affect the level of diastolic augmentation achieved by the pump. If the patient becomes tachycardic, there is decreased left ventricular filling time and therefore a decreased stroke volume. Less blood volume being injected into the aorta means less blood being displaced by balloon inflation and therefore less augmentation. A fast heart rate also shortens the amount of time that the balloon spends inflated and this decreases the amount of blood that is displaced during diastole. Hypovolemia, a reduction in the MAP, and a change in the systemic vascular resistance as a result of either vasodilatation or vasoconstriction can also affect augmentation. Once the patient has been assessed, it is important to consider the catheter position, size, and gas volume. Anything affecting the ability of the balloon to inflate fully, for example, if the balloon does not fully exit the sheath, the membrane does not completely unfold, or the catheter becomes kinked, will also affect the degree of diastolic augmentation. Other factors to consider are a low helium pressure, a leak in the circuit, or a balloon rupture. However, these factors will usually cause the balloon pump to alarm rather than reduce augmentation. In summary, in order to optimize the efficacy and improve outcomes of counterpulsation therapy, it is necessary to ensure appropriate timing of balloon inflation and deflation. This can be achieved by analyzing the waveforms produced on the console as well as monitoring the patient clinically. The intraaortic balloon pump can only estimate timing correctly if it has an appropriate trigger source to analyze. This may either be the ECG or the arterial pressure waveform. Although more modern machines are still able to trigger from an irregular cardiac rhythm, this may affect the level of diastolic augmentation achieved and it pays to attempt to restore the patient's rhythm to sinus. Weaning the patient from the intraaortic balloon pump may be facilitated by altering the timing such that a decreasing number of beats are provided by the pump and an increasing number provided by the patient. Some balloon pumps also offer the option to accurately reduce balloon volume and hence augmentation in order to provide a gentler wean for sicker patients who have been on the therapy for longer periods. <laughs>